streets of Vegas. So I was really just looking for an authentic way to, you know, uh, kind of document the narrative of, of Las Vegas hip hop. Kind of like wanted a, a voice for the streets. Kind of like you think, you know, you think of DJ Screw with his mixtapes. Uh, you think of Khaled, how he put on for 305, how he put on for the state of Florida. But I was just looking to be that voice, voice of Vegas, um, you know, for the streets, man, the connections to, to all the artists I was running into. Because I was producing, you know, like myself uh, at heart. I'm a producer. I started out rapping, you know, but after I kind of segued to DJing, you know, I still had the love for the game. And I kind of wanted to do a, a, like a magazine called Heat at first, which is... Uh, the Las Vegas independent hip hop scene. And that was before the streets of Vegas. So it kind of like evolved into the streets of Vegas. The heat was like old school print media that I was going to do. But of course that was, that was before the internet, before, you know, things really start taking off. Uh, and it's kind of slow. I would, I would go around and, uh, you know, meet, meet and set with the guys and have to, you know, tape the interviews and then go back and type them up. But it was a very slow process. But uh, you know, as the streets of, as the internet started to evolve, and I seen I could do like a profile page that I that I could show all the video links, uh, the show performances, the interviews, and stuff like that. It made more sense to go that route. So I just kind of kept moving that route, uh, you know. And like I said, it just started out as, as like I just wanted a channel, a, a, a hub for all the independent artists. from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, born and raised, and shout out to the Ville. Um, I moved out here about like 1991, 92, somewhere around that era. Somewhere around like when, um, you know, the height of the, the gangster rap or whatever in the East Coast, um, you know, 90 scene was coming in. I remember like I bought the Chronic on cassette, Dr. Dre the Chronic on cassette. I still got the cassette of that. But uh, I've been out here since about then, and you know, first I came out here as uh, as a rapper. I went by Rage, you know what I mean? I came out here trying to still do my rap career since like I'm 19. And I hooked up with a cat named Terry Bills, Mr. Below, and then my boy, um, Tony Mayo. He hooked us up. Tony Mayo, I met Tony. Every time I used to come out of here, I used to go down the street and around the corner from my mama's house. It was like my little crew of cats that I hung with out in Vegas, you know, Randy, uh, Steve Hawkins, uh, Lamar, Tony Mayo, all them cats. Uh, you know, Chulo, Insane, El Nifico, crazy. If you want to go there, you know what I'm saying? We used to all hang together. So, um, Tony and Terry, Terry was a producer. Tony was a writer, man. Tony was like MCs. Terry was like MC slash producer. But uh, they went to school together. They went to Bonanza together. So, he was the link for that. And we looked, linked up. He said, hey, man, this is my boy from, you know, from Louisville, and this is my boy, you know, T from Vegas. So all three of us hooked up and formed a little group, What a Brother Know. I think it was our name then. Yeah, some little, it was just like a one name put all together, What a Brother Know. Uh, we was kind of on the conscious, gangster tip kind of, you know what I mean? We wasn't bang, bang, shooting, but we was more conscious with it, kind of lyrical with it still, you know what I mean? Um... So that was that, and then you know we kept going forward with the group, and then uh, my boy Tony kind of fell back, got into some other stuff, you know, start doing his thing, and me and Tony, uh, Terry kept going. So we put a project out on um, on Black Market Records, uh, the same record company as uh, Brother Lynch. It was right before the season of the sickness was coming out. We was talking to Cedric, seeing him, we seen the artwork, we seen him lining everything up. You know, we drove up to Sacramento. It was like a 24-hour drive, man. It was like 12 hours up, 12 hours back. Uh, we went up there. I couldn't see this far in front of my hand. It was so much thick, small, uh, you know, fog and smog and all that stuff up there. But we went up there to ink the deal. And he was getting distributed through Sony. And so we was, you know, we had our own little private situation. Um, uh, WBK Records, I think. We shortened the name. Uh, and we was WBK Mob then.
Sharp, Water Brother, and the Older Duck. We just made a WBK mob. It sounded a little more street, a little more official. There's still some YouTube videos of it up, just the audio. You know, we didn't have a video then, but it was just the audio. So we thought we was getting a good, you know, we was inking a deal with a reputable black market records. They're getting distributed through Sony. We'll be getting distributed. We got ripped off, man. We signed a deal. We're thinking everything good. Hey, man, we got it. We about to hit the road. Uh, we, we got ripped off, man. We, we was doing all our own regional promotion, like going to Arizona, um, Cali. We went down south, too. I don't, I don't think we hit. No, we didn't hit Cali. We went to Arizona. We went to, like, uh, Dallas. We went somewhere in, like, Dallas. Somewhere in Houston, should I say. Not Houston. Somewhere in Texas. It was, uh, where's the wards at? It was Houston. We went to Third Ward. We drove there in a van. My wife cooked, cooked a big old thing of, of a fried chicken for us, and we hit the road, man, and that chicken, we made it last the whole trip, man. But it was live. We was going in there meeting the people. This was old school retail where you're taking your music and your posters and into the neighborhoods. We did the little street promotion around the, the stores and, uh, you know, all that, man. We, we did the leg work, and it felt good because it was an independent label, right? But then we, you know, we was calling the people saying, Hey, I look on the orders, you know, what's going on? They said it was out. We hadn't said it, said, oh man, it ain't selling. It ain't selling. So we like, well, they telling us one thing, now you saying something else, like they sending it back. So of course everything didn't sell, but we know some stuff was starting to sell. So it seemed like to us, he was using it as a, as a front and just keeping the money, saying, oh man, y'all ain't doing enough. Y'all ain't this, that. So, you know, we just kept going, let the deal kind of run out. After we ran out of product, we wasn't gonna put no more money because he was like getting over because he we, we was going through him through pressing, so we had to pay like a, a amount. We wasn't really signed; we was signed to his label through distribution, so we still had to put up the money to do our own, you know, uh, promotion work for the game. So it just seemed like it was a way for him to kind of charge up front and then try to back charge us saying the stuff wasn't selling they sending it back it, it was just a mess man we thought he was a straight up dude you know what i mean we went and met this cat face to face but you know how then after you after you sign the deal you go up there then people ain't answering phone calls you're getting his secretary you can't get in touch with him you know so that oh, was the whole running run the mill game on that man and i just I, you know i just charged it to the game i didn't take it personally i think you know my boy terry mr blow took it a little more personal uh, than I did, you know what I mean? But I feel, man, this is education, man. You know what I'm saying? Whatever we went through, we paid for this education. We got screwed, but we, we learned, you know what I'm saying? And we, we, you know, we was bigger than the situation before we got it. We was an independent label. So let's regroup, you know what I mean? And do and, and try it again. But he kind of lost, uh, I don't know, his drive for it or something after one bad deal. Like, you can't give up, man. You gotta, you gotta keep rolling with this stuff. So uh, I was gonna do a solo project. I was still, you know, writing as an MC, and I was like, look, look, man, just, uh, you know, we paid for a board, we had an Insonic MP, uh, EPS, a keyboard, our first keyboard, we, you know, he was doing beats on, I was barely learning how to do beats then, and I said, look, man, let's just charge the cost to the game, just just produce my album, and uh, we good, you know what I'm saying, just produce my album, I don't want no money or nothing, just throw me like 10, 12 tracks, you know what I'm saying, we good. And, uh, you know, he was going to do that, and it's kind of like he didn't want to do it or something, or like, kind of like, I don't know, because he's just hard one in it, but I couldn't get the track. So I said, let me get the board. I'm going to produce myself. I learned I learned the beats and all that. So I kept it for about three, four months, but, he, you know, he was getting antsy. He, he wanted it back. He was going back and forth. I just I just said, forget it, man. Just charge it to the game, man. You know, I had a few beats that i done, but not able to, you know, put nothing down to record on. It wasn't as, we wasn't in like the modern technology era as, as we in now where we can get like the little recorders and stuff like that. So I just kept writing, man, and, and you know, charged it to the game. Um, then I started kind of, you know, putting out tapes, you know, because I still like music artists, so I was doing it more like, not really a DJ yet, but just putting out street mixtapes, you know what I mean? Tapes that I was putting together with two cassette decks, you know what I mean? Just kept it going, kept my name going. And uh, later on, uh, I started DJing. I, I got the DJ moniker, and this is probably like we started DJing. Me and me and Marlo came back together on the, after the, the music, the, the record deal stuff fell apart. We started DJing around like '95, so you know, right after all this stuff '94, '93, '94, all this stuff kind of fall apart. Even in the '95, I was I was DJing. We started DJing backyard parties, so that was another lane for me to push the music, keep it going, and stuff like that. So I really started DJing around then. 
and just kind of, you know, grow the DJ business, man. And um, putting out tapes of the hottest artists, the hottest mix, mixes or whatever every month. And uh, that's how the DJ Default stand came about. You know, I was like, I love music from the heart. You know what I mean? And I I came from the era of the of the crates, the records, the carrying the records and all that stuff. I came from that era. Like, and I, I ain't saying like I'm no cold scratcher or nothing. No, I'm more of a blender. Uh, you know, more. You know, I ain't, I ain't gonna get up and win no. Uh, you know, uh, DMC uh, scratching contest. You know what I mean? I can cut and blend, but that, that just ain't my thing. Some of these cats will start scratching with their feet, man. I, hey, game over. They start doing that. But I'm more of a blender, music picker, you know, selection, you know what I mean? Um, um, curator of, of sound, you know what I mean? I know what I sound, I know what I like, I know what grooves go together. So I'm more of like, I put certain records or certain moves together. That's more of my, you know, forte in the DJ game, you know? And then, um, you know, we going along and I'm independent, keeping my ear to the streets on, on local artists now. And then um, I started thinking of a platform, you know. Um, I produced another group. Me and another group got together. Um, Frida Jackson. I really didn't produce the group. I had, I had a part in the group there before I really stepped all the way. Frida Jackson, um, my boy Big Short, Chris, Macintosh. And we did a little something called, it was a Russian Roulette compilation. And uh, we had one song on there, and uh, it was Paulie Mac. Shout out to Paulie Mac. He, uh, he had the connection like from Kansas City to Las Vegas, so they put a Russian roulette. One side was Kansas City people, one side was Vegas people. I can't I can't even find that, the, the thing. That was like a double CD. Uh, but it, it was a cold little lick, you know what I mean? It, it, was, uh, it was a nice project, you know? Then I got with um, my boy Kiss Swahili. And this, I'm backdating because this is before I stepped all the way for the DJ. I got my boy Kiss Swahili and we did Disciples of the Truth. Uh, and that was a cold project, you know, we was more like on the spiritual level then, still raw, but more like elevating our conscience, you know what I mean? And it was uh, D-O-T-T, -T, Disciples of the Truth, and we was kicking, you know, real game, real, you know, real knowledge. It wasn't from a street perspective, it was more of a spiritual perspective. I, I had hooked up with Kiss Wahili when we was doing WBK Mob album, right? My, our first album that was on, on Black Market, and it was called Set Trippin', but it was called S-E-T-T -T Trippin'. Because our record, independent record company, is called Power Set Recordings. So we called it Set Trippin', but we wasn't like gangster trippin'. It was more like a catchy name. But um, I knew Swahili from my apartments I stayed in. I knew he spit, right? So I said, man, this cat would be cold to get on a, a cut with. I don't know what we're going to put him on, but, you know, I'm from the era where you always put the next cat on. Like, you know what I mean? You feel somebody coming up, give them they shine. You know what I mean? Like, all the great artists did it. Like... Jazz did it with Jay-Z, you know what I mean? Um, Biz Market did it with Big Daddy Kane, like EPMD did it with Red Man, like you pulling somebody up that could be next, right? And so uh, Terry, Mr. Below, made the beat, and he was like, man, we had a song called Tech Nines and Clips. So I said, Kiss Wahili had that kind of like, man, it was, it was like, uh, I can't even think the term of his language, but it was, um, it was Wake Up. He was really conscious, man, and um, it was, you know, he had that, like, that that, that flow, man, that, like, um, Rastafarian flow. It was like a different flow, wasn't your average flow, but he was saying some conscious stuff about, you know, the reverse um, end of, you know, playing with the Tech Nines and Pips, because Tech Nines was hot then. Everybody was on them, so we gave three different perspectives in that song, you know, so, you know, that's where I hit up with him. So then when my three major, you know, project releases, I say, the WBK Mob album, Set Trippin', which was like 95, and then the Russian Roulette came later on, I, I want to say maybe 99 or something, somewhere around there. It was a lot of time in between, you know what I mean? A lot of stuff was going on. I wasn't getting equipment. I didn't have no equipment. Uh, and then later on, I hooked up with Swahili. He produced all the beats. He was right there producing, and that was like 2000s or something. But then after that, I still had my hand, you know, it was like my last, you know, flow. I was just going, I was just coming through to interview them cats. I had like Heat Magazine. That was that was before the streets of Vegas. And that was, you know, more like a old school paper magazine. So I was just coming through to interview the guys, what they had going. He was like, man, you ought to get on this. I'm like, uh, maybe I'll throw a verse on something. Just to, you know what I mean? Like, still see you got it or whatever. I still, you know, 
I love the rhyme part of it, but then I ended up being on the whole project. You know, it might have been like 12 songs. I might have been on like 10 or 11 of the songs, like almost all the songs of, of the of the comp, uh, of the project. Kiss Wahili and um, Disciples of the Truth, and it was called The Last Supper, and I came up with that, like The Last Supper, but it was The Last Supper, like the last time I'm going to suffer, because this is going to be like our ultimate grind. This is like the ultimate grind to get past The Last Supper. So that was my kind of discography, you know what I mean? Then I, I, I put out the, the uh, mixtapes with uh, Kev Lowe, Mr. Black, uh, them were like street mixtapes, like a like a drum. I was like the first of the Streets of Vegas, you know, brand I was putting out. And I put out now, I put out some on, on SoundCloud every month. Like I just did volume three, so it's all digital. No voiceover work, but I like the voiceover work, the cut, the bringing the record back, starting it over, give it that real mixtape feel. Um, so, you know, me and Kev supposed to be dropping another project. We don't know, it's, it's starting to turn into like, detox with Dre, like a 10 year promotion or something. It's been a minute, but hey, he said he's gonna put it out when he's ready. So when he do get ready, you know, expect me and Kev Lope to drop another banger. You know what I mean? You know, like I said, some vague OG shit. Um, some legendary, you know what I'm saying? Cause our last one was legendary. <laughs>